So you'll all have to forgive me, like my voice is just truly shot, right? I don't know if it's like from all the awesome chanting uh, and all the awesome speak outs, or maybe I'm just like, oh man, like this is like second to the last day, right? Maybe it's like the emotion that's going through my throat. But I digress. All right, as you all know, my name is Mikey. I like to cheat and just read off of stuff, right? But I'll re explain this over and over again. The reason why I want to do this is because I do not want to miss out awesome information when I do these introductions, right? And with that being said, this one in particular for this presentation, I really don't want to like mess this up because it is truly an honor for me to introduce two great guest speakers for tonight. So, without further ado, Jerry Vlasic, MD, is a press officer with the North American Animal Liberation Press Office, a former vivisector and CARDIS. Oh, wow. He has debated the scientific invalidity of animal ex experimentation around the world, speaks out about the benefits of a vegan diet, and offers lectures on the right of all sentient beings to live free of pain and suffering. His essays and interviews have been published in numerous journals and magazines, and he has been interviewed on radio, TV, and in print by journalists worldwide regarding animal rights, and in particular, the valid, valid validity <laughs> of direct action as a tactic in the struggle for animal liber liberation. And our second guest speaker is Joseph Buddenberg. Has been vegan for 20 years. Wow, wow. Mm. And active above ground and underground in campaigns. He has twice indicated an Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act charges and served two years in federal prison for his actions. Mm. That being said, sirs, the floor is yours. Take it away. Yeah. I'm Gary Vlasic, and I'll, I'm going to start out, and then I'll turn it over to Joseph for the uh, second half. And we're going to try to leave some time for questions in case anybody has any questions at the end. Um, so I, I was, uh, in addition to my normal animal rights activities, in, in 2004, there was a, a break-in at a laboratory at the University of Iowa in which uh, 401 uh, animals were liberated from a, a, a laboratory where they were being tortured to death. And there was a lot of media around the event, but there was really nobody telling the side of the animal activists, in other words, why this had been done. Obviously, this isn't a bunch of kids just trying to have a good time or somebody that's trying to make a lot of money. There was a, an ideological purpose for it, and nobody was saying what that ideological purpose was. And so I got together with a guy named uh, Steve Best, who's a professor of philosophy at the University of Texas in El Paso. Mm -hmm. And the two of us formed the uh, animal, North American Animal Liberation Press Office. Uh, we held a press conference where we uh, got a lot of media to show up and, and talk to them about why this raid had taken place at the University of Iowa. Uh, and, and tried and, and got some favorable footage out of it so that people were now hearing both sides of the story that these weren't people that were just uh, a couple of vandals that uh, wanted to do that. So that's the origin of the North American Animal Liberation Press Office. There had been other people speaking out <clears throat> uh, off and on over the years, but there was nobody that was really doing it consistently, and, and so we decided to do that, and we've been doing it ever since. So the main purposes of the Animal Liberation Press Office are to publicize events of illegal direct action that are taken on behalf of animals, number one. Uh, number two, we act as a media liaison. The, the people who are breaking into labs, the people who are um, throwing bricks through butcher shop windows, whatever they're doing to cause uh, uh, financial uh, pain to people that abuse animals or to actually liberate animals, these people can't speak up because if, they're, if they know who they are, they'll, you know, they'll be arrested, obviously. And so, we act as an intermediary and in that we gather up these events, we publicize these events, and then when perhaps the mainstream media wants to know why this happened or more information about what happened, then we serve to, to, to uh, talk to them and uh, give interviews, uh, and that's why I've been on you know the news and so forth, so forth so many times as several other of us have that are doing it over the years. So that's the second purpose. Our third purpose then 
is to support people if they do get caught and do go to prison like Joseph did, that we serve as uh, sort of, um, we try to, to make sure they get plenty of support while they're in prison, whether that means money for commissary items, whether that means letter writing so they, they, they're not as lonely and that sort of thing. That said, it's, it's very unusual. I mean, in doing this for 18 years, we've had, you know, just a handful of people that have ever gone to prison for any length of time at all. And that's one of the points I'd like to emphasize tonight is that breaking the law to help animals is actually safer than most people think. I mean, there have been literally thousands and thousands of actions, uh, illegal direct actions performed over the last 30 or 40 years since it started up in the UK back in the 1970s, 60s, and late 60s and 70s. And, you know, the number of people that have ever gone to prison for any length of time is very, very small. I mean, you can, um, I can't quite count them on my fingers, but it almost, I mean, it's just not that many, it's not very risky because despite what all the TV shows indicate, uh, law enforcement isn't very good at catching people uh, that aren't beating on their lives or something. So you know what I mean? It's, it's not a very risky situation. So everybody knows about all the ways we can go out and be active for animals. All of us have done most of these things, if, if not all of them, but, but educating the public, working on legislation, doing demonstrations like we've been doing this week, uh, even civil disobedience, which was a much more popular uh, maybe 20 years ago where people would chain themselves to the first doors or uh, things like that. Uh, those are all uh, legitimate forms of, of uh, working toward animal liberation, and they're all important, but they're not the only things. And one of the things I want to talk about tonight is why illegal direct action is a valid tactic in the struggle for animal liberation. It's not for everybody. I'm not telling everybody here to go out and break the law to help animals. Not at all, but I would like to just make you familiar with the strategy as part of the struggle for animal liberation. And indeed, every single successful struggle for any liberation, whether it was you know, against apartheid or uh, slavery or, or anything else, have always been people that have been willing to break the law and, and try to help people uh, or whoever is being oppressed, in this case, non-human animals. So pressure campaigns are something that all of you are probably familiar with, or some parts of it are actually going on this week, but pressure campaigns are especially effective, I think, in, in, in getting people to change the way they treat animals. And the, the current campaign, the Coalition to Abolish the Fur Trade here in the United States has been a very powerful campaign. They've gotten a whole bunch of fur designers and, and retailers to quit selling fur. They're, we're still going, we're gonna do a demonstration uh, tomorrow against one of those targets, and I, I think uh, these are the most powerful ways to use your time and energy as a grassroots activist um, if you want to stay on the legal side of the law because these are the this is where we see real results I'm a really practical guy you know what I mean I just look at what works and if something's really working well if people or designers are stopping using fur if there's only 80 fur farms in the United States now instead of 249 or whatever that there was 20 years ago those are results that positive results that I can I can see and so anything that I look at that has made that difference is something that I want to put my, my, uh, my time behind. So I personally think that the best two uses of our time are targeted above ground campaigns that are very spirited, including in-store disruptions and home demonstrations and, and gamut and, and target secondary and tertiary targeting where we go after not just the company that's abusing animals, but the people that are supplying the banking and the insurance and the garbage pickup for the people that are hurting animals. I think those are very important uh, campaigns. These are just a list of some of the pressure campaigns. I won't go over all of them, but they've been uh, various effective like consort beagles. These are all uh, breeding facilities in the UK back in the 90s. They were all, all shut down after repeated demonstrations over and over and over again. The Shat campaign was spectacularly unsuccessful eventually. It was a long running campaign for those of you that don't know to close a animal testing facility called Huntington Life Sciences, which has uh, three animal testing facilities and was the largest uh, contract animal testing company in, in Europe. Uh, they were driven to their knees and were this close to bankruptcy when the, the government, both the UK government and the American government stepped in and bailed them out, gave them banking services, insurance services, uh, arrested every, pretty much all the leadership that was working against in the campaign in both the UK and the United States. Um, and since then, the, the campaign never recovered. 
So these are some of the results I, I mentioned. There's currently a campaign going on in Europe where they're trying to close uh, MBR Beagles, which is a beagle breeding facility in the uh, UK that supplies uh, a whole bunch of beagles for animal experimentation. They've got a camp set up outside the perimeter of the, of the uh, place where the beagles are bred, and, and that's an ongoing campaign as well. And we, we, we'll wait and see whether that's successful. So I, I, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff because I don't want to talk. I want to talk about more about underground direct action. So people come to me and they go, "What? You're you're telling people that it's okay to break the law? I mean, you know, what the heck?" Uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of things have been, you know, codified into law. Slavery was perfectly legal. Everything they did in Nazi Germany was perfectly legal at the time. Um, our invasion of Iraq and killing half a million people, that was perfectly legal, of course, apartheid, everything else. So all of these things are perfectly legal within the law. So we all know that law doesn't make it right. And animal abuse is morally wrong, and I believe laws which protect those who abuse animals can be ignored. So what is the Animal Liberation Front? The Animal Liberation Front is one of several organizations that work underground to either cause economic sabotage to people who abuse animals and try to force them out of business uh, or to physically liberate animals that are, uh, that are being um, exploited. They don't hurt humans. The Animal Liberation Front has a very strict policy about not harming any individual uh, to the best of their abilities. Uh, to this day, there's never been a human being that's been significantly seriously injured or killed by anybody working on the Animal Liberation Front. There are, have been some intimidation tactics where people have been threatened and, and that sort of thing, but this is, uh, they're, they're very explicit in their, in their um, policies that they don't hurt anybody, including animals or human, human animals or non-human animals. This is just a graph showing the, the numbers of actions. You can see the numbers, uh, the yearly actions number in the hundreds every single year. This is both in the, in, uh, this is basically all over the world. That last, uh, column is for 2021, but that was just for the first half, so uh, it's probably about twice that. There has been a slight decline uh, since about 2018 in the number of actions worldwide. These are by country. You can see North America has really fallen down in the number of actions. There has been a marked decrease in the number of illegal direct actions that we know of that are going on in, in the United States over the last few years, and I can only speculate as to why that is true. I think it's also important just to mention while I'm on the subject that a lot of actions that happen, in, and Joseph will talk about this a little bit more, a lot of actions that happen that are illegal and that help animals are never reported. We never know about them. We never find out about them. So even though I showed you that there's several hundred a year that are happening around the world, there's probably five times that that are going on that we just never find out about it. I mean, not everybody that throws a brick through a courier's window tells anybody about it. Uh, and that's okay. We don't that's fine, but when they do that, we try to get media and we try to let other people know, perhaps inspire other people to do those kinds of things. So illegal direct action is another one of those strategies that has been shown to work, which is why I, I, I still lend my support behind it. Uh, hundreds of thousands of animals have been liberated and given new lives that would have otherwise spent their entire lives, short lives, in, in captivity and being hurt. Um, there was a horse slaughter plant up in the uh, northwestern United States that was burned to the ground by the Animal Liberation Front. No animals were harmed in the process, and that horse slaughter plant never reopened. And in fact, to this day, I don't think there is a horse slaughter plant in the United States at all. There was one in Dallas for a while. Maybe somebody knows. There's not. There's yeah, not I don't. I don't think it's not illegal here anymore. That's like I think that's where it ended. I think there were two places in the ended um, a few years ago. I'm forget. I'm forget the year, but yes. Um, there was a group of, uh, uh, of idiots that were using uh, palm uh, juice, palm wonderful juice, which is a form of pomegranate juice, and they were testing this drug on animals and, and claiming that it gave them better erections, if you can believe it or not, and, and trying to sell their product as a, as a sexual stimulant. Uh, they, they, they said they would never stop doing that. Uh, there were protests all over the country. They still didn't stop doing that. Uh, the um, one of the underground animal liberation groups, I don't think it was the ALF, but another one of the groups stepped up, called them in one day and said, hey, we just got through poisoning about 20 of your bottles in various stores around Southern California, and this is why we did it. And within a week, they said, we're not gonna test this on animals anymore. 
So uh, lots of fur farms have been closed. I mentioned that there were 200 and some odd fur farms uh, at the turn of the century and in, in the year 2000. Now there's, we're down to about 80 in the United States. Um, there have been countries now that have banned fur farming for various reasons, but the underground uh, actions have a lot to do with that. Uh, this was just uh, as recent as October 2020, and, and Joseph's going to talk more about main corporations because he would know better than anybody else, but uh, this was as recently as October. Thousands of animals were liberated um, in Utah and Idaho. Uh, mink, for those of you that don't know, are genetically wild animals. They're just because they've been kept in cages for a few generations. They're still uh, completely capable, and they've done studies that show this. They're perfectly capable of going out into the wild and surviving on their own. Does that mean every single one of those thousands of, of minks survived and lived a long and healthy life? No, but they all, 100% of them were gonna be gassed or annually electrocuted um, as soon as pelting season came around. This was a, 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 sl a duck uh, sl uh, slaughterhouse in the Netherlands. It was burned to the ground uh, back in May of 2020. Uh, hunting towers destroyed uh, in memory of Mike Hill, who is a, a hunt saboteur that was killed in England by a hunt saboteur that ran over him with a truck. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, people have criticized it, that it's illegal, that it's, it's uh, subjugating our message to the media, uh, you know, that long jail sentences divert activists, but I've already spoken to that, very almost nobody ever gets caught. Uh, when they do, they can actually be inspiring and, and uh, actually get other people to go out and do things uh, on their behalf. Uh, yes, we are battling a, a government that has unlimited resources. We're battling industry that has unlimited resources, but we're doing that all the time anyway with uh, above ground action. More to the point, I think if I, I think about myself as being one of those animals that's in a lab somewhere or in a mink in a, in a cage on a mink farm, and I think to myself, what would I want people to be doing? You know, would I want people to be uh, trying to get a law through the U.S. Congress to ban mink farming? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, and, I, and for God's sake, I hope it passes. I don't think it will. Uh, but would I want somebody to be, you know, coming out and opening the cages and letting me go? Uh, and there's only 80 of these mink farms in the whole United States. There's no reason why 20 of us, 20 people in this room couldn't go out and raid every single fur farm in the next six months. I mean, it, it, it's such a, and, and again, <laughs> illegal direct action isn't always the best strategy in every case. I, you know, I don't, I don't know that you know, threatening people's lives for eating meat necessarily is a good strategy. I don't, I don't think we're going to get people to eat less meat by, by doing that. But I think if we, if we look at certain situations where it's been shown to work, those section and fur are certainly amongst that group of, of targets. I think it can be, be very effective. A uh, little bit about, I mean, the ALF is often considered a terrorist organization, but I mean, really, I mean, who's a terrorist? You know, people that are torturing and killing animals in, in laboratories or on fur farms, uh, who's, who's creating more terror? Again, uh, in, within the animal liberation struggle, you know, no humans have been killed at this point. Uh, there probably won't ever be, but maybe they will, but the bottom line is we're not the terrorists. I mean, terrorists mean attacking somebody that doesn't have anything to do with anything just to make a point. And all we're doing is, all the under, not we, all the underground animal liberation movement is doing is trying to help people, animal people that are being oppressed. I, I don't think it fits the definition of terrorist. So just to, in summary, I think, you know, I think we can combine a, a variety of tactics to achieve a particular goal. Uh, for instance, in the uh, campaign uh, against uh, human, uh, non-human primate exploitation at UCLA, there was a lot of protesting going on. There was a lot of uh, directed campaigns with going to people's homes, vivisector's homes, and making them uncomfortable on Sunday mornings because letting them know they can't torture animals during the day, Monday through Friday, and go home and, and have a peaceful weekend. Uh, but the underground followed that campaign and stepped up and participated in the campaign. So. Uh, yeah, people were protesting, but also other people were uh, doing other things underground and, and, and adding to the campaign, and it, and it contributes to the success of the campaign. And again, we don't start with illegal direct action. If, if we can call somebody up, as the, even as the uh, people were saying with uh, Mercy for Animals, or maybe it was the... Art. Art. No, I was thinking more about, you know, the people that were saying, you know, we, we have to have a hard ask. 
So we ask people to, to stop doing what the, the bad things that they're doing. You know, we don't start by breaking into their homes or their businesses and liberating animals or inflicting sabotage. But if they won't change and there's no other way to change it, if we don't see any other solution to a problem, then I think we should consider illegal direct action as a, a one tool in the, in the toolbox, so to speak. Uh, I put this slide up, it's just a number, a uh, list of a few people that have died in the struggle for animal liberation. Uh, and that a lot of actions have been done on behalf of, of even Reagan Russell, who was just killed not too long ago. Uh, everybody knows who she is, I think. Um, I'm going to show, this is uh, our contact information, if anybody wants to follow us. Uh, we have some merch, Joseph and I have some merch out in the, out in the room tonight, if anybody's interested in some pamphlets and books and uh, t-shirts and whatnot. Um, so if anybody wants to follow that. And uh, I'm going to show a, a quick clip of a, of a liberation activity. I think Joseph probably has one that he's going to show too, and then I'm going to turn it over to him and, and let him go. <coughs> Uh, Mikey, a little help, maybe you guys can find your yep, that one. I think you can just hit space. Do what? Space one. Space one. So this is, this is footage taken by activists while they were, um, this was a, a pheasant liberation in which uh, several thousand pheasants were released in 2021. Joseph, Joseph, uh, this man right here is personally responsible for at least 6,000 captive mink being liberated in the wild. Woo! Wow. super militant at the time, um, exposed to ideas about like the animal liberation front, um, and maybe watched some undercover footage, and um, immediately I knew that's what I wanted to do with my life. Like, what happens to animals is so egregious and so violent that I think breaking the law is not just ethical, but it's a necessity. Um, I think the animal liberation movement taught me that like, we're responsible not just for the lives we take, but for the lives we could save. Um, so, you know, I was like 18 years old at the time, and um, I don't think the press office was around yet, but it was like the North American and a Liberation Front support group. And so I find a lot of their literature, the ALF primer, and I knew that maybe I couldn't organize like a lab raid or a fur farm raid at that time, but I could play my part. and. Um, Started off with like a lot of the tactics out of the early ALF primers, which were like super gluing locks, throwing bricks through windows, just sort of to try to make it as hard as hard as possible for animal abusers to operate at the time. Um, and you know, a lot of it sounds like childish vandalism, but like those things can like cause damage. They can increase insurance premiums. They can really like put companies out of business. Um, I remember sometimes we would have to like improvise with our tactics. There was a first store that we would hit so many times that they would like, when they would close, they would pull their shutters down. And so we had bought pellet guns and we would drive by the store while they were open and shoot out the windows. Um, those were some of my favorite actions. I don't know, I use like glass etching solution. 
just like this constancy of action to try to send a message that animal abuse is inappropriate. Um, so did that for a few years. It wasn't until I moved out to um, California in like 2005, 2006, that I started working on above ground campaigns and meeting a lot more activists. And um, like Jerry said, like underground actions can really um, be like a great escalation to an above ground campaign that's super active. So like um, we would do home demonstrations at the sector's houses during the day or with the shack campaign, we would target executives. And then later in the week, we would go and like paint strip their cars or throw bricks through the windows, whatever we could to get them to pull out of this laboratory to stop doing what they were doing. Um, and uh, we saw some success with that. Like a lot of companies would pull out of HLS. A lot of companies would cut their ties. Some of the sectors would quit doing what they were doing. Um, so, you know, just the efficacy of, of direct action is what sustained me and made me want to keep doing it. Um, and then later on, uh, I caught a federal case in 2009 for some of the activism I was doing against the sectors. Um, was in federal court for animal enterprise terrorism. Faced five years in prison. Um, went through the legal system for a couple of years. Got that case dismissed. And um, I think through that experience, I realized like, you know, I don't want to protest anymore. I don't want to like. I'm not trying to just send a message to these people. I really want to form an A-left cell and like really eradicate these industries. And um, that's when I started looking at like captive wildlife facilities and started really studying the fur, the fur industry. Um, there's a document called The Final Nail that's been circulating ever since the 90s, um, always updated. And every time it's released, like fur farm rates spike, sabotage spikes. Um, so I got, a, I got a hold of that document and it pretty much is a how-to on how to raid fur farms um has the lists of all the known fur farm addresses in the united states and so when i got the hand when i got my hands on that i just uh was obsessed with the idea of sinking this industry and formed an alf so and we just visited so many fur farms um started raiding as many fur farms as we could until i, I told myself that i was going to keep keep doing this until I got caught. And in the end, we raided 10 fur farms and liberated 6,000 animals. Um. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like, like I said, the explicit purpose was to wipe the fur industry off the map. And um, we closed a few fur farms with those raids. And right now, through like a confluence of, in through, through a confluence of factors like the fur, farm, the fur industry is really a shell of what it used to be. There are 274 fur farms and operating fur farms, and now there's only 80. Um, so it's an industry that's super vulnerable and really be targeted in effective ways by just small groups of activists. Um, and I think Jerry alluded to this, but the reason that main farms are chosen is because like they're captive bred, they're genetically wild, um, no rehoming is necessary, and um, yeah, I mean, the amount of economic damage that you can do to these industries, like, they have a closed breeding system. Once the animals are gone, there's no starting from the ground up again. They're done. So, they're, they have no choice but to pelt out and close up. So, so I mean... So, again, that's, like, another... That's just an example of, like, you know... A strategic use of ALF tactics is on an industry that's like already hurting, already vulnerable, and um, you know that a small activist community can just kind of like decimate. So. Awesome. <laughs> oh sure, yeah. I did film some um, undercover footage at a fur farm last year, and this is like. The footage that is identical to everything that I saw when I was ready for a time. So this is a, a Utah fur farm in 
It's got a lot of room in there. Mm -hmm. Just straight up just the products. That's like where they live, like they're in those cages like all the time. Absolutely. And then there's just mounds of shit under them. Uh, that's the food. That's, that's the food? That's the food, it's like dog food. Oh. Um, sometimes they're held six to a cage. So, you can imagine living in a tiny matter cage your entire life with five others. Quick question, Joseph. Thank you so much for that. And to both of you. Um, you mentioned the other day while we were speaking that um, in these mink farms, some of the mink are the ones that are actually used to bred right. the minks. And so if you can't save them all, probably saving those or freeing those to kind of put a dent or a hurt to that farm itself where they can't no, where they can no longer breed them. Is that a strategy as well? Sure, yeah. So mink are bred for they're not domesticated, they're captive bred for the pelt quality. And so they have, um, you know, genetic lines going back several generations. So, um, yeah, the, the breeders will have a breeding card on the top of their cage. Um, there was a farm years ago in Massachusetts that had been raided a few times. And um, activists broke in and released only the breeding stock. And um, the farm shut down, $500,000 in damage. Uh, 500 mink were released and the farm was healthy out in the Healthy out is an industry term for closing out, not closing out. So that's definitely like the most effective, you know. And it, it, two people can liberate a thousand mink every 15 minutes. So, you know, you figure two a team of two. Two can liberate a thousand mink wow. every 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, that's right so that. nice. <laughs> 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 Wait, what's their, like, and where, where are they? Like, they can just be released. Um, is, uh, were they able to be able to survive? Yeah, I mean, nature is genetically wild to North America. Oh, okay. They're native to North America. Okay, so it's just wild. their habitat. Right, They're exactly. Different. So, okay. you see a lot of mink releases in both North, both the U.S. and Canada. Okay. Um, you also see mink releases outside of, of Norway. Yeah. I think there's other species of mink that live in Norway and Sweden. Okay. They've done. Uh, they've actually done studies where they uh, they put radio collars on captive mink and released yeah. them into the wild. Rod Coronado was an activist that did a lot of mink releasing uh, back in the '90s, and okay. he actually himself did a study where he put a radio collar on mink and then they would track them to see that they could survive, so wow. that they would immediately disperse over wide areas. It's not uncommon <laughs> for them to travel miles and miles every day, which wow. is why it's so sad to see them in these little tiny cages. But they spend their entire lives. In um, so they, we know for sure that they could survive. Again, does every single one survive? No. But if you listen to what the, the, mink, the, the mink owners will say after a raid, they'll say these ridiculous things like, well, you know, two-thirds of them got run over by cars even though they're out in the middle of nowhere and there's no traffic at all. And then they'll say the other, two, the other third of them froze to death, you know, on the first night or something. And it's just ridiculous. You mean the they industry lies? Yeah, it's like, how, do they, like, how do they know? Are they watching? Are they following them to say, like, oh, it's okay, two-thirds of them are being run over, a third of them are being frozen? They send out, they send out like, packets of press releases to their farmers and use them as a raid. Yeah. Wow. So Commission USA does that. And um, wow. a lot of times they will just send their press talking points to local yeah. press and they'll carry it. They'll run with it. How does the same thing work with, with regards to foxes? liberating foxes. Do you have any insights on that? Um, there are big tons of fox liberations in the U.S. as well, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of their survival and releasing them? Yeah, they're all capable of surviving. Yeah. They, I don't know that they've done a lot of studies on, on what the percentage of survival is. It's definitely more than 100% that will be killed if they stay behind. And um, there have been bobcats liberated uh, that have been kept in cages. Um, so it's not just mink, but mink are the, are the largest number and they're more heavily concentrated. We, we know more about them. Okay. Yeah, they, we released bobcats and they did survive. They were never recaptured. Um, there was a, uh, a story I love from animal liberation history that was uh, three wolves were liberated from the zoo, um, three captive wolves. And, even like an apex predator, they were never recaptured. So I would tend to think that foxes can survive a while. Oh, yeah. And I think that goes that there is natural instincts. <coughs> people point to natural instincts, they are.
these are not tame animals. If you, if you look at laboratory liberation, they're a lot more difficult because a lot of those animals are, you know, purposely bred mice and, and hamsters and things like that who you can't just go and turn them out in the lot, you know, next door or, or they'll all, virtually all of them will be dead within, you know, a couple of days. So those animals, when they are liberated, we have to, they have to find homes for them uh, and find people that are willing to take care of them. Um, so yeah, it's that's another reason why you know you choose different strategies for for different, uh, different situations. Is this a sanctuary for animals liberated from the fashion industry? Well, not knowingly because it would be illegal if you were if you knew you were assisting somebody that was in committing a crime. So there are sanctuaries that just don't ask any questions. Uh, if animals show up at their sanctuary, they they don't really care where they came from. Um, so yeah, it, it does happen, but it, it's. Uh, it has to be carefully planned ahead of time. Some questions over here, go ahead. Would either of you kind of touch on the necessary like security uh, measures that need to be taken with this kind of work? Yeah, there's a lot written on the subject. Uh, our website, animalliberationpressoffice.org, um, has uh, references to several of these things. There's a uh, uh, we have a, we, I have copies out here of the uh, ALF primer, which has a lot of information. There's a lot written on just basic security culture that even all of us should know about, mm -hmm. the, just to you know keep people from interfering with what we're doing. Right. Uh, which can then you know you can step that up then um, uh, if you're going to do something illegal. So there's a lot of resources out there. Anybody, and that kind of brings me to a good question that hasn't been asked yet, but it probably will be. Is that is how do you join the ALF? There's not a, you can't go down to the. ALF office and fill out an application. <laughs> you know, there's no membership cards or you don't have to pay dues every month or anything like that. But um, historically speaking, people, like minded people just decide to get together and somebody they can trust, and that can be difficult. Sometimes it's just somebody acting all by themselves. One person, like Joseph said, one person can liberate a thousand mink in 15 minutes. So you don't have to have a squad of six guys or girls going out there and, and doing all this. But in, in his, historically speaking, people get together, they trust each other, they start re, they start learning about security culture and how to stay safe and not get caught, and then they just go out and start doing things, and then they become the ALF. They can, some people call them when they write it down and tell us about it, they, they sign it ALF, other people don't bother, it doesn't, you don't have to label yourself the ALF if you don't want to. Uh, yeah. You can. You can call yourself anything you want. There's other groups. There's Animal Rights Militia. There's Justice Department. And there's a whole bunch of different people that have just kind of made up names for their for themselves and, and call themselves that. So that's totally up to you. But that's the way you join an LL. We get requests all the time at the press office. Well, uh, can you put me in touch with your chapter in New Orleans? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, can you put me in touch? I mean, not only do they think we're the ALF, which we're not. We're a press office for the ALF, but. They also just think that there's a way to do that. And obviously, if anybody knew who was already in the ALF, then law enforcement would be all yeah. over them. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Like, how do you guys keep from being infiltrated <laughs> yourselves? I'm sorry? I was going to ask, how do you guys keep from being infiltrated yourselves? Like, you know, maybe the police put somebody undercover to kind of uh, like... It's always a possibility. And we, we, over the years, we've definitely run across people who were trying to insinuate themselves into either our organization or into our local animal rights group and then make the jump into the ALF mm -hmm. because they thought we were part of the ALF. So there are these people that come around, there were people that would come around and say, hey, we want to make a movie about the ALF, can you introduce us to somebody that's in the ALF and we'll follow them around and do it and we won't tell anybody who they are and yeah. you know, that sort of thing. So we, we get that all the time. There's yeah. definitely, uh, there are definitely been repeated attempts to try to find out who these people are, but the cells are pretty uh, insular. They don't, you know, they you find people you trust and you just keep your damn mouth shut. Yeah. Yeah. To say to to Kalina's question, um, so work alone if you can. Um, don't ever take your cell phone to a crime. Um, there have been conspiracy cases, there are conspiracy cases where people just brought their cell phone geolocation data to a crime scene. Um, and don't ever let anyone know that you're doing these kinds of actions. Um, you know, I, I have friends and partners that would have no idea that I was involved in ALF activity. So, yeah. I would say the majority of the people that have gone to prison have been people who talked about what they did, uh, either to a loved one or to some, or just even one of their cohorts who's now wearing a wire. Like mm. that was what happened up in the Northwest when a lot of people went down for actions up there. They got one guy 
uh, who happened to be a heroin addict, and they said, we're going to send you to jail for 10 years on heroin charges unless you wear a wire and go talk to all your former comrades and get them to talk about it. And they talked, you know, to somebody who they thought they could trust. Yeah. You know, but they talked, and they got it on a wire, and a lot of them went down. And most people that end up, almost nobody ever gets caught in the act, and Joseph can talk more about how he got caught if, if he wants to, but the, the bottom line is it's, it's rare that you get that anybody ever gets caught in the act. It, it frequently happens that they talk about it to somebody, mm -hmm. and that's how it ends up happening. Hey, my, so my question is actually <clears throat> somewhat relevant to Shreya's, it's with boxes. So as you know, what's being depicted right now, like we have a positive movement with the mix, right? So let's say, like tomorrow, like total mink liberation. What is your outlook on um, how the industry is going to react with uh, other animals? Let's say foxes, for example. Um, I mean, that's a difficult question. I mean, I think they're, they're used for different types of garments, so it's kind of a separate industry unto itself. Um, yeah, I mean, once that happens, people can target fox farming and wipe like those off the map. Do you think the industry is going to be like, all right, so minks are like completely free? Like, are they going to, do you think that they're going to start getting worried about like the other um, animals that uh, they use for fur type of stuff? And like, all right, you know, like, what's the next target? Because I don't Absolutely. think they're going to stop. I mean, there's been a 30-year campaign by the ALF against the fur industry on the retail level, on the at the point of production, and the fur farm. So, yeah, absolutely, would be concerned, especially when they're when they're such a small industry like that. You think that? Let's say they're gonna get like worried, like you know what? Like, don't think this is worth it for any animal whatsoever. Let's start like, like getting into not using animals as commodities. So that's, that's, that's a like, strong message, maybe, or not. I think that's why a lot of the um, retailers have pulled out. They've just seen the writing on the wall with the other ones, you know, dropping first. So it can have that residual effect for sure. Yeah. Joseph, how did you know when to leave? I imagine that being there, you want to empty every cage, yeah. but with, for self-preservation purposes, you have time constraints and the time to run to the car. How sure. did you know when? Um, you'll see the farmer's lights flick on or it just becomes, you know, generally try to get there at two in the morning, try to get there, you know, and stay till four or five in the morning. And in those rural places, you know, people tend to get up pretty early. So, you know, you, you just go with your instinct when it's time to leave. Um, like I said, if you can empty the breeders, that's the, that's the best way to go at these places. So, <coughs> I feel good when I had like, 2000, 2000 or 3000 years for those years. I feel good too. <laughs> 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 How do you know the breeders from the, uh, the ones? Um, they're not they're they're usually, I'm sure maybe they have, they have, they have, they have a little more like um, security in the shed, but they also are just they put breeder cards in the top of their shed. Oh, okay. On top of the yeah, shed. Like it's a breeder on it or what? Yeah, it's something that's Yeah, so are a lot of these farms kind of outdoor where there's not a lot of walls so the minks can just get let out of the cage and run out into the fields, or? They're open in the sheds. I visited, well, I raided 10 fur farms that the government accused me of. I only saw a fence once. Okay. Um, so they're, they're corrugated, open-ended sheds. You can just walk right on. Um, did have one farm that had a fence and took that out with a pair of bolt cutters and a few men. Yeah, easy stuff. <laughs> Universal key. So there's no like transition period. You literally just open the doors and they just run free. You don't like put them in a container and take them somewhere. You can't really touch them. There have been some that um, did that to like film the footage of making it in the first video, oh, yeah. which is like very difficult for like propaganda video. But um, no, generally you just let the footage go. Yeah. Luckily, the farms are located in very rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, they, they tend to be um, in wild places where there's plenty of room for the meat to, to roam. Uh, it's just the way it works. And most of the farms are in Wisconsin, Utah, and mm -hmm. Michigan. Michigan. And, um, 
they're just they just tend to be in very rural places. So I mean, nobody's got a fur farm in you know downtown uh, Akron, Ohio, or something. You know, it just uh, wouldn't work out. Well, I, I visit a farm right along a stream, and so as soon as I open the cages, the animals run away immediately. Oh. That was like one of my most memorable experiences. Um, besides like the bulk cutting, did you bring any other tools, and did you have to like break a lot of locks inside of that? Um, I mean, like I said, I only saw it back once okay. during the liberation of bulk cutting with it. Um, some people will take muriatic acid or butyric acid to sort of do some economic damage to the machinery, um, and that's been that's been the case with ALF lab rates as well. That you want to inflict as much economic damage upon the farm as possible. What kind of acid? Uh, muriatic acid. Everybody take your notes. Can you get that? <laughs> <laughs> Can you get that? A lot of us have to take your notes. Is it good for my for journaling? <laughs> you guys are down after this. I'm just saying. <laughs> No, no. Oh, a couple comments. Evan's gonna get mad if he's around. But one time when we were um, in the area on some of New York, I saw three mink crossing the street, and it was so cute. They like literally helped each other to make sure they got across. <laughs> um, I was wondering. Do you have to wear pretty heavy duty gloves with the mink? Because I heard they're pretty vicious. You, you should wear gloves. They're not vicious, but you should. They're not vicious? Yeah. I, I did have one experience where uh, I was opening the cage for me to try to bite my finger off. Yeah. Oh. Um, but they're not vicious. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, they're not. Generally, they're just looking to be free. Right. And then, the only experience I have with yeah. my hand is when uh, Some of them, yeah, I just the run. farmer comes to uh, grab them and, and kill them. Wow. And so, mm -hmm. I think their natural instinct is to strike out at them. Yeah. Um, so and then the other thing I wanted to say when Shreya asked was um, a f one of my friends that told me about experiences um, who also went to prison, they said that the mink and the foxes were totally different in the sense that the mink ran right out yeah. and the foxes are like so beat down and terrified that sometimes you open the cage and they just cower and they don't even move. They're more timid animals, so yeah. it sort of requires, um, with, with a cell of two people, you kind of have to tip the, the cage over and they'll run for their lives, yeah. yeah. But they sort of like just kind of cower and stay. Mm -hmm. um, Jerry, I may have missed it, but so Joseph provided this uh, background story for like his journey to like this point. Um, I guess like I'm looking for like a specific timeline for you. Like, at what point and why did you decide? Okay, like I'm gonna go for like direct underground action type of stuff. Um, yeah, so I've been vegan for 29 years, and I kind of come up through the ranks of, of doing everything, of just, um, you know, writing letters and uh, sending them to people and, and then protesting. And then I got involved with the Shack campaign. So I went, I went to the UK and, and hung out with those people. And um, I just kind of became radicalized more and more, not so much just because I'm trying to make trouble, but just because I've always just looked at what I thought was the most effective use of my time. So if I'm gonna spend X number of hours a week, you know, doing something, I just wanted to know that I'm doing the most effective thing I can do. And you know, I, I personally don't think that sending a lot of money to you know national organizations that have six figure incomes for their executives and, and pay a lot of money for buildings and rent and things like that, I just, I, I just never was comfortable with that being uh, a very effective form of activism. And so I just tried to say, well, how can I make the most difference as one person um, on, on the planet while I'm here. And those are the things that I've, I've just looked at and seen the most results from from one person. Again, I don't want to say that HSUS has never done anything useful for animals, or I don't want to say that you know PETA doesn't do good stuff for uh, educating people about animal abuse. But as far as one person goes, I think the most effective thing you can do is what Joseph did, and, if, and go out and just liberate animals or cost somebody who's hurting animals so much money that they can't hurt animals anymore.
more mm-hmm. or you know whatever you can do I, I think any one person that's the best you can do if you can't do that for whatever reason you know maybe you have kids at home and uh, you don't want to risk uh, even though it's a very small risk uh, I mean, we're much. One of us is much more likely to get arrested at Home Depot than, you know, than somebody is, you know, liberating mink or, or um, you know, throwing a rock through a first door window or something. It's just not very likely. But anyway, if you can't do that, then I think working on uh, focused uh, campaigns like the CAF campaign, the Shack campaign, the you know, the other campaigns that are going on around us that are very focused on one abuser and you don't relent until that abuser gives up. Um, so I, I, I don't like to criticize other groups or other tactics in the movement. I think, you know, we need many, many oars on, many hands on many oars, as the saying goes. Um, but if you want to look at what one person, if you want to maximize the effect, those are, what, those are the things that I think will maximize your effect. And that's why I have migrated in that direction as the more I've learned about, about the movement. Do either one of you um, want to, I, I've noticed a lot of video recording going on, want to either ask for restrictions, for example, not placing these videos on social media, or ask for clarification regarding the purpose of the videos? I, this question has come up with me over and over again. I've been recorded saying what I'm telling you guys and, and even some more radical things that people have asked me about. Uh, I've never shied away from saying what I believe and what I think needs to happen, and I've never shied away from encouraging people to get active and, and do whatever needs to be done. And I'll, I'll, I said it on 60 Minutes one time. I'll say it on, I'll say it to anybody that wants to hear. So I personally have no problem with people recording what I have to say and um, and publishing it. Joseph may feel differently. If he does, then uh, I think that we should kind of come to an agreement about if anybody is recording this, um, what's done with that. So I took two photos uh, for your presentation in your part. Um, I just did it for the audience with the observations. Mm-hmm. Is that good to be posted? Like I said, I don't care if anybody wants to post anything. You can record the entire event as far as I'm concerned, but it, Joseph has his own. I would just like to have like, like the consensus from both parties. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll let's take pictures of both of you, or do you prefer to not? Sure. So what, I think, again, I'll I'll just reemphasize that what we do now, not what Joseph has done in the past, but what we do now is we speak to people about strategies in the struggle for liberation, and we just tell you what the strategies are, and I don't think this particular strategy gets talked about very much uh, around the country. I mean, I just tried to sign up for a conference that HSUS is putting on next summer, in Washington DC because the you know the farm thing isn't happening again I think because of COVID. <coughs> and uh, they said yeah no thanks so they won't let us talk there there's a lot of places that won't let us talk um, because they don't want to hear what we have to say they, they think their way is right oh and by the way you know send us some more of that hundred million dollars a year that you're sending us but um, you know I, I I've never had a, a problem with saying what I say and, and I, we are not the ALF I want that to be clear Joseph was in the ALF, uh, but he's not now, and I'm not in the ALF. I don't know anybody that's in the ALF, so don't ask me if I know anybody that's in the ALF. Or, yeah. I can't help you join the ALF. <laughs> yeah, like I said, so if you want to join, does that make me ALF? <laughs> <laughs> the letters of recommendation. So, I, like I said, I, I was, I was, I've been doing this since 2004, so that's uh, 18 years now, and I've never gone to jail for anything I've had to say. I've gone to jail for other reasons. I've never gone to jail for anything that has to do with what I'm telling you tonight or what I'm saying tonight or what I'm writing or publishing or putting on the website or Instagram or anything else. So uh, we are not the ALF. We like to serve as a liaison between the ALF and people like you and also just the general public. Because amazingly enough, I mean, people don't go, oh my God, they broke the law. Well, I'm going to go out and eat a steak. You know, that's not how people see things. A lot of people, when we explain to them why people are breaking into labs, they're going, oh my God, I didn't know they did that to kids. Well, I'm glad they, to, to animals, I'm glad they got those animals out of there. Or, yeah, man, I'm glad they released those mink into the wild. I mean, the general public is amazingly supportive of people who are doing this kind of thing. And I mean, we, we know because we talk to them all the time. We talk to the mainstream media 
all the time, and they're always amazed, and and they're more often than not supportive. I mean, you know, you get the industry, you know, the industry uh, publications and stuff that'll trash us, and there's all kind of bad stuff said about us online by all these industry groups. But if you look at, you know, the New York Times or the Washington Post or something, I mean, if they interview us, they tend to tell our side of the story, and they tend to be pretty fair-minded about it. Can you add to something that Hillary said earlier? Um, so, yeah, sort of like, you know, every ALF activist I've talked to um, kind of was of the same mentality that they're going to keep doing this until they get caught. Um, if they get caught, but once you get caught, your dudes operating underground or over. So, that's another thing to keep in mind that, yeah, my ALF action. Somebody else's turn, right? Yeah. I feel like, um, in this day and age, 2022, with technology having advanced so much in the last, whatever, couple decades, there seems to be a camera at every intersection. There's a lot more surveillance. There's a lot more tracking of communication. Do you find that in this day and age, it might be more difficult and more likely to get caught than in the past by doing these underground actions? I don't think so. I mean, there was always, there's always ways around of th those things. I mean, you know, when we were raiding for farms, we would hide our car in a in a cornfield, in a rural cornfield, and hike in with ski masks. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's been ALF actions where the FBI has shown up and can't even figure out how the activists got in. You know, so okay. whether they had access to the key cards or whether they were propelled through the roof, um, yeah. Got it. I think that there's always a way around that security technology. People see a lot of stuff on TV about, you know, everything's coordinated and they're, you know, they're able to track you and the bottom line is, A, they're not as smart as you think they are and the other thing is they're just not willing to utilize vast amount of resources that they use on, you know, suspected, quote, you know, these people that are killing people and things like that. They're, they're just not going to, I mean, I, you know, they're, they're not even going to bother looking for fingerprints because it's just not because, they because they're just animals. animals. They don't care. Right? Somebody, somebody did ask earlier how I got caught. Um, so I had been subject to like three federal, three federal investigations prior to um, raiding main farms, and um, I think I just became a suspect for the FBI. And so they sort of had a cheat. They planted some evidence. Um, in my case, they found a GPS device in my car that I had never utilized on any of these raids, um, and they they planted that evidence. They also persuaded a judge using like a sneak and peek warrant um, for like a theft of guns in a similar county near a mink farm to get a sneak and peek warrant where they broke in my car and found like bolt cutters and wire cutters. So, I mean, I think a lot of that was just because I was high profile and I had already suffered like a lot of previous repression, so. Go ahead, <laughs> sorry. No, 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 you're fine. These are all great questions and great answers. Um, when you're experienced working with the press, um, what is it like? Do you feel like it's a challenge having to just compete with what the mainstream media would accept from, you know, from those who are actually profiting off of the exploitation of animals and are often the ones who are paying for advertisements and are traditionally in this space? So when we want to get the, the information about animal exploitation out, do you feel like there could be a conflict? Yeah, there's always yeah, there's always a conflict of interest because, like you said, there's people paying for advertising on uh, these TV commercials, you know, and things like that that are obviously animal exploiters by by design. So it's always a um, it's always a um, struggle to get things out there, and that's why when high profile things happen, they almost can't they can't ignore everything, and so when high profile things happen, then uh, they don't ignore you and, and they have to tell your story. And I, I don't know, I've just always been surprised that they were willing to tell our side of the story. They may or may not have agreed with us, but they were willing to. And again, I, you know, our attitude is like, all of our attitudes, it's like, you know, what's wrong with you people? Why don't you see what's going on here? And, and I, I think coming at it from that approach, they, um, I've been surprised that they've told our side of the story as much as they have. Is there something that you specifically tried to do to get them to see 
see this as an important issue when pitching to uh, certain press outlets? Um, well, I mean, other than issuing press releases and, and providing background information, uh, you know, like about, you know, mink farms and things like that, I mean, we, we try to, you know, can try to show them what, what's out there and they can choose to ignore it. Or not. And sometimes they do, obviously. Jerry, you emphasize how unlikely it is for people doing liberations to get caught. And of the very few who do get caught, the very, very few, um, you did mention that, um, could you go over again where people, the general AR public, could show them support, find them for letter writing, um, for emotional support, putting money on their books so that they can buy vegan food if they don't have access to it? Yeah, there's people that maintain lists of political prisoners. Our website has uh, people who are in prison uh, primarily for just animal rights stuff. Um, so yeah, you can always go to our website and find that information. Uh, we. You know, we, we try to help the people that do get caught. And right now, because of the United States, there's only has been seen kind of a, a, a lower number of actions of, in the last few years. I think there's only currently two prisoners and mm -hmm. two or three prisoners in, in prison right now for, in the United States. There's a few in, in Europe and uh, Eastern Europe as well, but not many. I mean, there's there's you know there's no more than I don't I don't think I've ever seen more than you know six or eight people in prison at any given time. I mean, it's just not very Considering that there's thousands and thousands of actions going on, it's uh, it's really pretty unlikely. But yeah, anybody that wants to do prisoner support, you know, our website has a, a page just on prisoners and how to write them, what kind of things you can and can't say, um, and that sort of thing. Jerry, um, uh, yeah, can, can you tell us about the two prisoners? Some of us already know, but. For those who do not know, like in Europe, you mentioned two people who got arrested, one in Slovakia and the other one I don't know where. Um, the one so with the bus. Yeah, the two you're talking about, one, there's a guy in, uh, named Ludislav in, who's in Slovakia that Jusenia has actually been writing to. Uh, he was given a 12-year sentence for having explosive mm -hmm. devices and setting off an explosive device at a McDonald's restaurant. Didn't hurt anybody. Um, I think it was when they were closed. Um, so he's one, and then there's another guy who's not listed. I, I'm corresponding with his support team now about whether he wants to be listed or not, but uh, y'all may have heard of him, but he, he, uh, he took a bus of hostages in Ukraine mm -hmm. and kept them hostage uh, until the president of Ukraine uh, asked people to watch Earthlings on, uh, on TV, and this guy did it, the president actually did that, and asked everybody in the country to watch Earthlings, and then he released the, the people, he didn't hurt anybody. Um, and so he's in, I'm not sure where he is right now. He's about to be sentenced though. So we're, we'll know it just happened the year before last, I think. So he's a, another kind of an interesting guy. His name is Maxim, Maxim, and he's in the Ukraine. And there's a couple of people in, uh, I think one in Germany and one in Netherlands that have been um, uh, uh, put in jail for various actions. So yeah, if you want, it's a great, it's a great experience to write to these guys and girls and find out about them. and find out what their lives are and just and kind of, it makes their makes their whole day to get letters in prison. Is there any way to measure? Um, there's also Joseph Gibby, who was on the run for a few years. Uh, he's the burning down a horse slaughterhouse. Uh, he's awaiting charges, he's pre-trial, but he might end up seeing some significant prison time. So if that mm -hmm. happens, people should support him. Did they burn down slaughterhouses? Yeah. 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 And everyone on the bus said that he was quite lovely to them. Like, they told them they wouldn't get hurt, and he just wanted the video to, to be played, that people could watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> Did the members in the bus watch the video as well? <laughs> 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 Did you want to say that's not in the tail end action? I don't think it was played as an tail end action. Yeah, so after you got done being underground and you had to move to the above ground, what did you do to help you feel like you were still doing a lot of action for the animals? Um, I mean, I've been participating in a lot of the 
cash campaigns mm-hmm. in Texas. So we're working hard on all those campaigns. We're super out in Neiman Marcus where they're headquartered. Mm-hmm. Um, and just winning campaign after campaign through, you know, disruptive public protests. And um, that was not really possible when I was taking action. We would go super hard against the fur industry and it didn't seem like much was changing, at least on the retail level. Um, yeah, so that's, that's helped me stay inspired and stay active. Okay. Joseph, you said that um, when you got arrested, even though you got arrested and it might, have, it might feel like a sad moment or you said that somebody like in Canada was liberated animals? Oh yeah, yeah, so, so I turned myself in um, to start serving my sentence May 2nd, 2016. Um, and you know, one of the, one of what I thought would be the unfortunate aspects of my imprisonment would be that, you know, the movement would be at a standstill, everybody would stop doing what they're doing, but a day after I turned myself in, a fur farm in Ontario was raided, 2008 were liberated. So, you know, people weren't gonna let the repression stop them from fighting for animals, and that was very beautiful. I got that, like, the first week of my imprisonment. I got a letter and a postcard saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, if there's no more questions, thank you guys. And uh, like I said, we've got a few uh, pamphlets and books and um, stuff if anybody wants to stop by. Not sure how long it'll be there. We may be able to do it tomorrow night, too. So seriously, seriously inspiring, and we're all honored that um, we're here to inspire all of us and get a different outlook in activism. As I mentioned a while ago, I know I joked about it, but to take into consideration, to journal some of the stuff of um, learning information, you know, put in your tool set, put into consideration with your activism, right? Because we always want to grow how we want to um, send the message and do the action all for the animals, right? Whatever is efficient and effective. So put that into consideration. Again, thank you so much for your honor um, with your presence and all the things that you've done in the past and still doing here in the present time. So with that being said, we'll be transitioning into, uh, can we talk about tomorrow's yeah. stuff? Okay.